why weren't the legislatures allowed to vote on bills that had support, broad-based support? Because the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate um, put all of the bills together into two, two big omnibus bills. That have this is Democratic Visions. Here's Tim O'Brien. We're happy to have uh, Steve Elkins drop by. Steve is the endorsed DFL candidate for House Seat 49B, a West Bloomington significant portion of Edina in bits and pieces of Minnetonka and Eden Prairie. After a lifetime of uh, dedication and service to the city of Bloomington and to the greater community, Steve threw his hat into the ring sort of at the last moment. Steve, welcome to Democratic Visions and Thanks. give us just a brief on how you got into the race. Well, our, uh, our current incumbent uh, representative, Paul Rosenthal, Great guy. does just an amazing job. Um, it, it basically, he got to the point where his children are ready to enter uh, college. Uh, you basically can't pay college tuitions on a legislator's salary, and he got a, a job offer that came through uh, at the very last minute, I mean, literally the weekend before the filings closed, and uh, decided to take the job. And uh, this is something that I've long wanted to do, and uh, wasn't seeing a path to being able to do it because uh, our two Democratic legislators in, in, uh, in this district, uh, you know, Melissa Franzen in the Senate and Paul in the House, are young, doing great jobs and basically could hold those positions as long as they wanted them. My Metropolitan Council position uh, will be up at the end of the year. Um, I just paid off the house, <laughs> turned 66, uh, you know, get uh, eligible for full Social Security. So uh, I can live on a combination of Social Security and legislators' salaries. I wanted to have this opportunity for a long time and grateful for the opportunity. Well, uh, we are honored and very pleased as a Democrat uh, in uh, Senate District 49 that you are willing and able to serve in uh, House seat 49B. So tell us a bit about yourself, uh, Steve. Let's start with uh, who you are. Yep, so um, my j wife Judy and I uh, moved to Bloomington 33 years ago from California. I am a transportation economist by education and moved here to be part of the marketing planning department at Republic Airlines during its uh, rebirth <coughs> under, under Stephen Wolf and survived the Northwest merger and headed up the pricing department there for, for several years. But I left the airline industry uh, in 1991 after Wilson and Checky bought out Northwest and uh, ended up reinventing myself, uh, getting into uh, information architecture, business, business intelligence software. And for the last 25 years, I've been an IT uh, architect, currently employed by uh, Optum Health in, uh, in Eden Prairie. Uh, I've been working on electronic health record systems, which is uh, you know, tremendously satisfying work. The other thing I did when I left the airline industry in the early 1990s is that I wanted to have some way of keeping my fingers in transportation, and so I uh, started volunteering for like the, the City of Bloomington's Traffic and Transportation Advisory Committee, did that for a few years, served on the Bloomington School Board's Transportation Task Force. Our two daughters, Michelle and Danielle, uh, grew up in Bloomington, went through the, uh, the Bloomington Public Schools. Michelle is an art historian, makes a living at it actually, and the younger, uh, younger daughter, Danielle, made a successful career for herself in, uh, in transportation engineering, kind of a little bit of a chip off the old block. When were you first elected to office? Um, you know, uh, first elected to uh, the Bloomington City Council uh, in 2001 after serving a couple of years also on the Planning Commission. And I served uh, on the uh, Bloomington City Council representing District 3, which is the northwest quadrant of the city from 2002 until I was appointed to the Metropolitan Council by uh, Governor Mark Dayton in 2011. I represent Bloomington, Edina, Richfield, and Hopkins. And what interests have you pursued as a member of the Metropolitan Council? I've been a member of the Transportation Committee, of course, and the Community Development Committee. That's allowed me to uh, get very involved in regional transportation issues, but really what my passion has been and why I wanted to serve on those two particular committees is that I, I'm really interested in the intersection between transportation and land use. You know, how we are, how are we uh, leveraging our uh, investments in transportation to further economic development uh, and, and vice versa. And uh, housing is uh, an issue uh, that I've uh, been taking a particular interest in. The problems we face in transportation, uh, y you can see what the solutions are. They're not intractable. We just have to be willing to in invest in them, invest wisely. But housing is a much more difficult problem. Are you a light rail advocate? Uh, I am. 
I, you know, Southwest light rail? Southwest. Uh, we're going to get this done. Um, you know, we've had uh, some hiccups along the way. Uh, it said that, uh, you know, every uh, uh, rail project of, of this size is, uh, is complex enough that it, it has nine lives. And uh, so think, far, it's only had Peter, seven of them. I think I've heard Peter McLaughlin <laughs> the, uh, say yes, that once Yes, so it's twice. only on its seventh life. So um, I, I think we're about to overcome the, the last hurdles. And... Uh, uh, now looking at opening it uh, in, in 2023. You told us uh, that this was a that it sort of came together in your personal life, uh, meshed yeah. with the opportunity to run. Uh, but I want to turn the, t mm -hmm. uh, the page just a little bit. Uh, what do you hope to accomplish over in St. Paul? When I'm when I'm elected, I want to make sure that we've secured a uh, sustainable source of funding for both uh, our roads and bridges and our transit uh, system. Uh, and it's going to be particularly uh, challenging in light of the fact that all of the uh, um, futurists are saying that within 10, 15 years, we're going to be uh, living in a world where, which is dominated by uh, electric vehicles rather than gasoline-powered vehicles. And so the, the gas tax as a source of, of revenue uh, is already declining. That's interesting. You know, most people don't know this, but oh. if you look at funding for roads and bridges at uh, all levels of the system, the single biggest source of uh, revenue for roads and bridges is the property taxes that we pay to maintain county roads and city streets. So what goes in place of the gas tax, some sort of tax based on usage? You would have to replace it, I, I think, a tax basically on how many miles you drive instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, historically, a lot of, uh, of concern about uh, how you do that while, um, you know, maintaining individuals' privacy. What other issues are of concern to you because there are problems with the state uh, that have to be addressed? Well, I, I, I can divide problems into urgent versus important. Well, why don't you do that? Yeah. So, you know, the urgent ones are the ones that have to be done immediately mm -hmm. and aren't necessarily more important. We, but we know the, the tax conformity, that's, that's going to happen. So that yeah, doesn't that's, bother me. Yeah, that's an urgent one. So yeah, but it's going to happen. That's going to happen. But, you know, the form of it uh, is, is important. Uh, okay. You know, the, uh, the version that Good the governor point. vetoed, uh, you vetoed it because it had, uh, you know, escalation factors that would have uh, turned our current surplus into a deficit. Well, you mean the this. automatic tax cuts regardless yeah, the of the economy, tax the economy cuts. is doing in the next five yeah. years? And the, uh, the $200 million tax credit for, for corporations. Well, those are Republican gems, aren't they? Uh, they that's you know, why they were in there. So, mm -hmm. But I, I think we need to get, you know, s you know, get it cleaner so it, it's revenue neutral, protects the, uh, the, you know, the taxpayers of Minnesota against the uh, unintended consequences of the, the federal tax bill that was passed at the mm -hmm. end of 2017. I, can, uh, I can't imagine the <laughs> average voter is uh, particularly interested in uh, giving uh, uh, a multinational corporations another hundred million or two hundred uh, million dollars in On top of the break. billions that they've already received in and the federal bill, it just doesn't bill. seem to make a lot of sense. But yeah. uh, but uh, that was part of uh, the the uh, bill that was vetoed too, was it not? Yeah. Uh, dispersing money to people that or entities, corporations yep. that hardly need it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so, oh, and, so and I was say, the, the other urgent, urgent thing, yes, yes, the other urgent thing is that uh, you know the reason we had this train wreck at the end, end of the, the the last session is you, mean you don't you don't agree with Representative <laughs> Anselmo over in 49A that this was a very productive two years of the Minnesota Legislature. You know, I, since the end of the session, I, I've gone to several you know town hall or session wrap up types types of meetings. What I, you know what I got out of those is that the uh, you know the biggest frustration that that people in both of those forums had wasn't uh, with any particular bill. It was with the general dysfunction that prevented even, you know, common sense consensus things like the, uh, you know, improved uh, nursing home safety or the, uh, the, the common sense gun safety uh, bills or the hands-free driving bill. Even these things that there was broad consensus on um, couldn't get through because couldn't get they, through on an up or down vote. Couldn't get uh, yeah they weren't the people were the legislators were not allowed to vote on those individual well, why, issues. Why did that happen? Why weren't the legislatures <laughs> allowed to vote on bills that had support broad based support? Because the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate um, put all of the bills together into two two big omnibus bills that had uh, you know all of the good stuff in it but uh, it also included all sorts of things that uh, uh, they knew they couldn't get past the governor's veto any other way so they took a gamble and he vetoed them. So it sounds to me like the solution to the problem is to not allow the Republicans to 
be in the majority where they in turn are dictated by special interest groups. That and, uh, and take the opportunity once we win control of the House uh, and as you know former Speaker, current Supreme Court Justice Paul Thiessen suggested is get enforcement of the, the uh, Minnesota Constitution single subject bill which you know res restricts bills to uh, a single subject the, the title which is you know the purpose of which is expressed in the title and uh, you know get that into the House rules so that uh, it, you know, it governs the conduct of the House but itself. That, but Steve if they if they enforce that that would bring transparency and accountability into the system. What a concept. Yes. When I, when I w went over to file on the last day of the filing <laughs> period I, I went up to the House DFL caucus offices and uh, you know receive information for new candidates and whatnot so I was in the office of Susie Bates who is uh, the, the lead legislative assistant for the House DFL caucus and she asked me was it or anything else that you want uh, Stephen so I, I saw this laying on her desk what is that it, it's a copy of the House rules as was adopted in 2017 and I, I pointed at said Susie can you get me one of those and she said here you can have this one mm -hmm. so the very first order of business is the adoption of the rules. So by the time that this legislature reconvenes, Isn't the first order of business the election of the speaker. Okay, okay, second order, first order they're, of the speaker. But just so as important, are this they not? Just as important, yes, because that helps. The speaker to, sets the agenda. The yes, speaker's so, the one that says, "I'm so. going to allow uh, no gun control measures to come to the house that have not been approved by the NRA." That's the yep. Republican speaker of the house yep. that the Republican majority elect. I mean, it's almost obscene that they. Uh, formalize and admit they admit yep. that their agenda is being dominated and dictated by the NRA. I mean, yep. unbelievable. So Melissa Hortman is going to be uh, an amazing speaker. Good. And after Democrat, we, uh, Democrat. democratic. Yep. And uh, you know, as soon as we've elected her speaker, the next thing we're going to do is amend these rules Tremendous. so that the uh, the single subject rule is in, enforced in the rules. Okay. And so, after that, we'll do the tax conformance. So now, bill. tell me, tell me uh, other bills or other measures that you would uh, seek to. Uh, uh, seek to have passed over in St. Paul so when I think, you're elected. I think in terms of that, you know, the urgency, I think that the, let's get, after we get, get the tax cons mm -hmm. conformance done, we need to get things that had broad consensus and didn't get passed because they got, you know, thrown into the junk bill. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the nursing home safety issue, mm -hmm. uh, the, the common sense gun issue. So it's mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the, the red flag, uh, you know, with dangerous people, uh, universal background checks, uh, you know, eliminating the sale of military assault rifles and, and bump stocks, which turn those into automatic weapons. The hands-free driving bill, so mm -hmm. no, no talking with the cell phone in your hand while you're driving. All of those things common that, sense? that the, the common sense stuff that are have you a broad biker? consensus. Are you, are you a bicyclist? I am a bicyclist. I, I do a little bit of it. I'm yeah. really kind of scared. You get out there and people are, they're not looking at the road. Yeah. You know, as a cyclist, the, the thing you worry about most, especially if you're commuting to route to work on, on the streets. You commute I to work on the bike? A couple times a week when I can, yeah. Do you really? Great. Uh, so how are you going to campaign? What's, what are you gonna, how are you going to focus this? You gonna have, are you going to go door to door oh, to door? That's the key. Paul Rosenthal was great at doing that. He's great. I'm in the, uh, I learned from uh, the great Ann Lincheski. She was, the, you know, the, had the same mantra, knock on every door. Uh, Again, I am going to conclude this by uh, the way that I opened it, uh, which is to thank you for your dedication and service. And you will be one great representative from House District 49B come November. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, kind words, Tim. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Edina, Minnetonka, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.